Assalamu alaikum. Dear learners, before starting a formal discussion on course contents, let's go through a bit of history of instrumentation and measurement techniques humans have used in the past. This will pave our understanding of how modern day field of instrumentation has evolved. So, the need for measuring something was always there, but it became more important as human societies kept on developing. The most basic form of measurement was and still used in trading. Whenever you want to exchange one commodity with the other, measurement must be there to establish a fair trade. Even today, we are using this form of measurement. However, the oldest known measurement systems which archaeologists have discovered are from 3rd or 4th millennium BC that is around four to five thousand years ago. These systems are mostly from Egyptians or the inhabitants of Indus Valley. This establishes that people living in these regions were already using measurement systems, no matter what form of the systems were being used. In those times, societies were local and trading was not inter-society, but was intra-society. Therefore, they developed local standards for measurements. For example, what we call today a meter length might not have been used by Egyptians of third millennium as a standard length. Or what we call one kg today may well be quite different than the unit of weight they were using in their time. Normally, Farming and vegetation was the primary profession of most of the people living in those times, so they used seeds of certain plantation to establish standards. For example, to measure volume, they filled a container with the seeds of a certain plant and then counted those seeds. They will call the volume of a container as equal to, for example, 1000 carob seeds. These types of systems were fine unless you encounter another civilization which is using some other way of measuring volume or any other quantity. In such a case, you must either convert your units or must agree on a common measurement standard. This is called globalization or standardization of units. And as the human civilization kept on growing, and interacting with each other, the need for standardization was felt more than ever. In this context, the unit of length was the first one that was standardized, and through various transitions, it has been refined to great levels. If we talk about the standard unit of length just 100 or so years ago, it was defined as 10 days to power minus 7 times the polar quadrant of the Earth and the platinum bar of this much length was made and stored in a controlled environment. Later on, in 1889, a platinum iridium alloy bar replaced a simple platinum bar. You must be wondering why that happened. What was wrong with a platinum bar? Well, this brings us to a very important aspect of standardization of units. For standardizing something so that it can be followed anywhere, the standard shouldn't be affected by any environmental condition or any other physical phenomena. For example, the platinum bar shouldn't change its length no matter to what conditions it is exposed. It should maintain its length on earth, on moon, under the sea, on top of the mountain, or even if taken to the sun. Now that's quite a tough thing even for platinum iridium alloy. Initially, man never thought of visiting the moon or any other planet or far reaches of the universe. So we didn't feel the need for defining a standard that should work equally well outside Earth's atmosphere. However, as we advanced, we felt that Instead of globally accepted standards, we should create universally accepted standards. This was the reason that in 1960, a unit meter length was redefined as 1.65 or something into 10 raised to power 6 
wavelengths of the radiations emitted by Krypton 86 element in a vacuum. Maybe this was the year when Superman fell from the sky and we came to know about the kryptonite. However, in 1983, we once again redefined unit meter as the distance traveled by light in an interval of 1 by 299792458 seconds. Now this standard looks like it is quite promising and we can still use it even if we encounter any alien from the Delta Quadrant of the Milky Way Galaxy or anyone from Centaurus Nebula. You can refer to the table 1.1 in your textbook to find out the current standards for defining various physical quantities. As we advance and we are faced with different situations, these standards may change. As we pass through the Industrial Revolution of 19th century, the need for instrumentation and standardized measurement was greater than ever. This need motivated us to develop more efficient ways to measure physical quantities and hence multitude of instruments were developed. Especially in the last part of 20th century, digital computers came talk of the town and were further used to refine our measurement methods and instruments. No matter what kind of system we developed, it was majorly motivated by the amount of accuracy and cost effectiveness it can induce in the already built system for measurements. Through the history and even today, two major applications of instruments and measurement systems revolve around regulating trade and monitoring functions. The trade can be between humans or between a human and a machine or between machines only. For example, when you go to the market to purchase something by weight, that is trading between humans. And when a human worker loads some raw material into a machine so that machine can process it, that is trading between a human and a machine while when a machine transfer its product or material to another part of the machine that is a trading between two machines. The application of monitoring function is also as important as the first one. For example, when a gardener measures temperature and moisture level of the ground to make necessary adjustments to his greenhouse environment is an example where some physical quantities are only being measured and correspondingly some action is being taken. You can also find this kind of application in an air conditioner at your home where the temperature is being measured and the working of the compressor is correspondingly adjusted. You can think of many other examples where some physical quantity is measured and corresponding action is taken. Think of such a situation and comment in the comment section below. As this discussion is more relevant to engineers, let me take this opportunity to talk about a purely engineering example of control system and how the instrument and measurement system is going to help us. In the domain of control systems, a very famous form of closed loop control system is an automatic feedback control system. The shown flow diagram is a very simplified version of a real life situation, but it'll, it'll be enough for explaining the whole process and the idea behind it. Let's consider that winter is coming and you have a heater to maintain a warm environment in your room. Now, how this heater achieves its target? You'll start by setting a reference temperature that is the temperature which you want in your room. Let's suppose you want a temperature in your room to be around 26 degrees Celsius. As soon as you start the heater, it will measure the temperature of the room and calculate the difference between the two temperatures. The larger the difference between the two temperature is, the more heater must work. Let's suppose the room is at 18 degrees Celsius. Therefore, the error in the temperature would be 26 minus 18 equals to 8 degrees Celsius. The heater will start working because of this difference of 8 degrees Celsius and correspondingly the room will start to get warmer. 
as the heater will keep on heating the room, the temperature sensor will keep on measuring the temperature and the difference will be calculated at each moment. Once the room temperature reaches 26, the difference between your selected temperature and the room temperature will reach zero. This zero error will turn off the heater automatically. Now, as the heater has turned off, the room temperature may start to drop once again. The temperature sensor will still be working and monitoring the room temperature. Now, let's suppose the temperature once again falls to 25 degrees Celsius and hence the error between your selected temperature and the current temperature would be 1 degree Celsius now. This error will once again turn on the heater but not with as much power as an error of 8 degrees Celsius used. So, the heater will slightly heat the room unless temperature approaches 26 degrees once again. This on-off or more practically tripping off heater will continue for as long as you leave the heater on and the temperature of the room will keep on fluctuating around 26 degrees Celsius. One thing to notice over here is that the amount of fluctuations around your set temperature will depend on a number of factors out of which the accuracy and resolution of the temperature sensor would be the most important. Let's suppose the temperature sensor measure the temperature nearest to 1 degree Celsius. So the heater can maintain temperature up to 1 degree accuracy or we can say that the fluctuations would be of 1 degree Celsius. However, if you used a cheaper temperature sensor that can measure temperature for example nearest to 3 degrees Celsius that is 20 degree then 23 degree then 26 and then 29 and so on then the fluctuations would also be of 3 degree or more. Therefore the accuracy and resolution this system can achieve can never be better than the accuracy and resolution of the measurement system. This measurement system may utilize a single sensor element to sense the physical quantity that it may or may be utilizing multiple sensors. For example, to measure the room temperature, an AC is using a single temperature sensor installed inside the AC. However, an HVAC system responsible for maintaining the temperature of the large hall might be using multiple temperature sensors placed at different locations in that hall. Moreover, the whole system may be enclosed in a single box or in separate boxes physically displaced. No matter what kind of measurement system you are considering, it will have these basic blocks in it. The first and the foremost thing is the sensor element that is going to sense the physical quantity. Then this quantity will be converted into a suitable representation or form. For example, in the example of temperature sensing, the sensed temperature is converted into electrical signals. Later on, this signal may be processed for various things ranging from conditioning to making it ready for transmission. Conditioning means removing noise or unwanted portion from the signal or amplifying it or adding two signals or any other suitable operation. Once you have conditioned the signal, you may transmit it or in some cases use it locally for further decision making, storing and or displaying. You are encouraged to find out different measurement systems around you and identify basic components in those systems. Students are further encouraged to post their response in the comment sections to get additional participation marks. So this was everything about a bit of history and basic outlook of a measurement system. We are going to study in detail what these components of measurement systems are and what is happening inside each of these components. I have discussed mostly the measurement systems in this video lecture. However, in the next part of this lecture, I'll focus more on the instruments and what is the motivation behind these instruments. How humans have learned to develop sensors and use them for measuring useful quantities. So do watch the next video in the series to know everything about sensors, 
So therefore, goodbye and take care.